the first question we have is from hema what is surrender and how to practice surrender to guru that's the first question okay um surrender means giving ourselves to god or guru um in the bhakti marga in that is bhakti is all about giving us giving um in the early stages of bhakti marga we try to give up the mamakara the mine my likes my dislikes my desires my hopes my fears we try to surrender at first we try to surrender our will to god and that is good that all, will all contribute to the purification of the mind that is the bhakti marga as bhagwan makes clear in upadesha india the bhakti marga really begins from um begins with nishkamya karma that is as bhagwan says in verse 2 um of upadesha india um <clears throat> karma will not give liberation because the fruit of karma is transient it will pass away um uh yeah and therefore it will just cause uh, the more we do action the more we get cast into the great ocean of action but then in verse 3 he says um i'm paraphrasing however if the action is done nishkamya that is without desire for any uh fruit any any benefit therefrom but uh kartana karkam done for god it's we we do it just for the love of god he doesn't mention the word love there in the original tamil but in the malayalam version he says ishwara priti and i which means for the love of god so um we are if we do action not for anything that we can gain from that action but just for the love of god that will purify the mind and show the way to liberation gati vari kamikam he says gati vari kamikam show the way to liberation what that implies is only in the purified only the purified mind will have the clarity to recognize what is the path to liberation when we start on the bhakti marga god seems to us to be something other than ourself so we worship god in name and form um so um but we we cannot know um that is a means to purify the mind but it's not a means to it's not a direct means to liberation of course we we can't even begin on the path to liberation until we until the mind is purified at least to some extent so because only the purified mind will have the clarity to recognize what is the path to liberation the path to liberation is not doing but being um so that's what bhagavan is expounding in the early verses of upadesha india um so after saying that uh, nishkarmiya karma dam for god will uh, purify the mind and show the way to liberation he says that in verse 3 in verse 4 he talks about what kind of karmas can we do without desire for the love of god he says this is certain uh puja japarandiana are respectively actions of body speech and mind and each is each is uh, superior to the previous one what he means by that is to the previous uh, uh, that's in this order uh, puja japa and dhyana better than puja is japa better than japa is dhyana but what he means by superior or better it's more efficacious in purifying the mind because puja is an action done by body uh japa is an action done by speech dhyana is action done by mind each of these instruments is more subtle than the previous one so it's more efficacious in purifying the mind then he goes on in the next three verses to describe each of these in verse 5 he gives a very broad definition of puja that is puja isn't just uh it in, of course includes ritual puja 
but it it includes it, it encompasses more than just ritual puja. What he says is enuru yavum ireuru amena eni vari padal undipara isan nal pusane undipara. The enuru, the eight forms. This is a um, this is I think it's a Shaiva Siddhanta concept. The eight forms of Shiva are um, the five elements. Sun, moon, and jiva. So that just about encompasses everything. All material things are made of the five elements. Um, sun, moon, and fire. So basically, it means everything. If you if you have that atti, if you if you consider any any, he says, considering. If you consider everything to be a form of God, and treat everything accordingly. So, for example. Obviously, one way of doing it is the ritual puja. But for example, if you see a, a person in distress, if, they, if they're hungry, you give them food. If they are, um, if they are some, suffering from mental anguish, you try to console them in, in, in an appropriate way. But you don't do it just with the, fact, the, the feeling, I am helping this person, but with the feeling it is this person, it, Shiva has, God has appeared in the form of this person, and I'm doing this for God. That is what, that's what he implies in that verse. So anything we do, for example, in, in the modern day uh, world, we know that a lot of our actions are contributing towards global warming, and global warming is doing a lot of harm in this world. So if we try to live in a way but we minimize the impact we have on our environment, and minimize the harmful impact we have on our environment. If we do that, considering the whole world to be God, where it's, therefore we should treat this world with due respect, that is good worship of God. So we could, Bhagavan gives scope in that fifth verse for a very broad definition of, um, of, uh, of puja. Then in the next verse, verse uh, six, he talks about different ways of doing japa. He says, rather than, um, he puts it in a very, very compact way, but if we, if we uh, um, draw out the implication, what he says is, rather than stotras, japa is good. Rather than japa done aloud, japa done softly within the, uh, within the mouth is good. Or that ja, ja, ja means just slowly muttering is is or softly muttering is good, and better than that is manasika. Uh, that's mental japa, and that mental japa is a form of dhyana. So when he says better than, of course he means more efficacious in purifying the mind, because we can be singing the name of God aloud. That's good, of course, but. While singing the name of God aloud, our mind can be wandering here and there. We can be thinking about all, all our worries and so many other things. Um, but whereas if we're doing it mentally, we, we have to fo be focusing on that or we won't be doing it. So um, always going subtler is more efficacious in purifying the mind. So the mental japa is a form of dhyana. And then in the seventh verse, he says, rather than the... Japa, rather than dhyana that is interrupted, but dhyana that is uninterrupted, like the flow of a river or the, the falling of ghee, that is, uh, that, is, um, that is efficacious. So in all these, he's describing different types of action, action of body, action of speech, action of mind. And these are all for purifying the mind. But the essence of these is that we are doing without desire for any fruit. We can do all the same actions with desire for fruit. Then that's not going to purify the mind. It is the, that is not the action that is purifying the mind, but the love with which we do it. So when we are doing actions without desire for the fruit, that is, that's a, a form of surrender. Rather than asking anything from God, we are just Worshipping God for the love of, we are thinking of God just for the love of God. So that is, that's, there we are, we are minimizing the mind, the mamakara, the mindness. But we still, who is, do, who is doing all these actions? 
I am doing it. I am doing puja. I am doing japa. I am doing jhana. There's still an I there. So that is, that's the beginning of surrender, but it's not the complete surrender. The complete surrender is only when we give up the I. Um, so then in the next verse, verse 8, Bhagavan makes the important um, switch, as it were. And that is from meditate, so long as we're uh, doing puja, japa, or dhyana, we're taking God to be something other than ourselves. And we're worshipping God in name and form. So what Bhagavan says in verse 8 is, um, uh, Anya bhavatin avanahamahum ananya bhava me undipara anatinam utumam undipara. That means um, the, uh, rather than anya bhava, the ananya bhava in which he is I is best among all. So anya bhava means in this context, in place meditating on God as anya, as something other than ourself. Whereas Ananya Bhava is meditating on God as nothing other than ourself, with the understanding of Anaham, he is I. Um, so, uh, so what Bhagavan means by Ananya Bhava is self-attentiveness. Because what is not other than other, it's only ourself. We are not other than ourself. So Ananya Bhava means meditating on nothing other than ourself with the understanding that God is what is shining in our heart as I, as ourself. That is the best among all. When he says it's best among all, that implies this is the best among all the practices of bhakti. It's also the best among all forms of dhyana. Rather than meditating on anything other than ourself, meditating on ourself is best. Because meditating on anything other than ourself is a mental activity. It's a movement of our mind away from ourself towards some other thing, some name or form of God. Whereas in Ananya Baba, our mind is not moving away from ourself. Our mind is remaining in its source. In, in other words, it's remaining in, our, in, its, in ourself. We, we keep our mind fixed on ourself, nothing other than ourself. So that is not an activity, that is a cessation of activity. Because as Bhagavan made clear elsewhere, such as in verse 25 of Uludunapada, but also in so many other places, the nature of ego or mind is to rise, stand and flourish by attending to things other than itself, by grasping form, as he says. Um, but to uh, subside and dissolve back into its source by attending to itself. So to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, we thereby subside. So when we subs we are the doer of all these actions, the puja, the japra, and dhyana, when that I that rises to do puja, japra, or dhyana turns its attention back on itself, it will thereby subside back into its source. Its source is our being, the pure I am. That is the source from which we rise as ego, the false awareness, I am this body. So the surrender can be complete only when we surrender this I. And the only means to surrender I is this practice of Ananya Bhava, which is, of course, another name for Atma Vichara. In Atma Vichara, what are we doing? We're fixing our attention on ourselves. So what Bhava means in verse 8 by Ananya Bhava, it, it's a, another description of Atma Vichara. Atma Vichara, as he, as he makes clear in um, Nana, in the 16th paragraph of Nana, he defines what he means by Atma Vichara. Sada kalamum manate atma bilve tirupchkutan atma vichara mendrupaya. The name atma vichara is only for always keeping the mind on oneself. That keeping the mind on ourself is what he means in verse 8 of Upadesh Undia as Ananya Bhava. And that is giving ourselves to God. Um, then he, in the next verse, verse 9, he explains. What happens when we uh, uh, fix our attention on ourselves? By the he in the what he says in verse nine is, um, 
Bava Balatinal, Bava Natita, Bava Terutale Undipara, Parabakti Tatuum Undipara. Bava Balatinal means by the strength of that Bava, that meditation. What meditation? He's obviously referring to the meditation he talked about in the previous verse, which is Ananya Bhava, the self-attentiveness. So what happens when we attend to ourself? We thereby subside and remain in our being. So by the strength of that Ananya Bhava, being in Sat Bhava, Sat Bhava means the state of being, our natural state of just being, being in the state of being, which transcends Bhavana, it's Bhavana Tita. Bhavana in this context implies meditation in the form of mental activity. That is, if we're meditating on anything other than ourselves, that is a mental activity. When we attend only to ourself, that mental activity subsides, that we subside and our mental activity obviously subsides along with us, and thereby we remain in satbhava, the state of being. And that is parabhakti tattva, because that is giving ourselves completely to God. And he said the same thing in Nana, in the 13th paragraph, he gives a definition of what is surrender. He says, Anma chintane tavira, vera chintane kalamba vataku, satram idum kodamo, apmanishta paranai iripade, tanne isanaku alipadam. Apmanishta paranai iripade means being as apmanishta paran. Apmanishta paran means, um, one who is um, who is uh, who is fixed as oneself. In other words, be, what what he implies by Atmanishta Parana Yeripade is being as we actually are. That means being without rising as ego. That is giving ourselves to God. But how to be without rising as ego? That the the, the means is indicated in the first clause. Anma chintane tavira, vera chintane kalamaritku, satram idum kadamo. Anma chintane literally means thought of oneself, but it implies self attentiveness. So, except self attentiveness, giving no room to the rising of any other thought. That is, if we are, to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, we are thereby withdrawing our attention from other things. And no thought can rise. Thoughts all arise in our awareness. So only if we attend to them, thoughts can arise. If we are attending only to ourselves, we are thereby giving no room to the rising of any other thoughts. So what he implies in that sentence is being so uh, keenly self-attentive that we thereby give no room to the rising of other thoughts. By that, we are remaining as we actually are. We are remaining subsided in our being, and that is giving ourselves to God. Because our self means uh, uh, this I, this I that rises as ego, this has to subside and remain subsided in the state of pure being. That is, um, that is giving ourselves to God. So, though Bhagavan talked, Sometimes he talked as if there are two paths, either investigate yourself or surrender yourself. If we go deep into either of these two paths, it will be cl clear that they're one and the same. That is, we cannot investigate ourselves without thereby surrendering ourselves. Because to the extent to which we, um, we attend to ourselves, we thereby subside. And that subsidence is surrender. So, but we we cannot investigate ourselves without surrendering ourselves. But we can begin to surrender ourselves before we begin to investigate ourselves. But they, the surrender cannot be complete without the self investigation, because so long as we are trying to surrender ourselves by any means other than self investigation, all we can surrender is the mind, because. Who is trying to surrender? I am trying to surrender. I'm giving up all my desires, all my likes and dislikes. I'm giving up everything. But I still remain there, the one who is giving up all these things. So that is not... Bhagavan talked about Atma Samapanam. 
Atma there doesn't mean ourself as we actually are. There, Atma means e uh, ego. So giving up ego, that is the true surrender. Of course, in order to be willing to surrender ourselves completely, we first need to be willing to give up our likes and dislikes. So the, all that is, all the practices of the path of bhakti, all the nishkamya practices of the path of bhakti, that is, that is, and bhakti really begins only when we are doing things nishkamya. Um, they are all purifying the mind and making us, giving us the willingness to surrender ourselves completely. That is, if we cannot even give up our likes and dislikes, our desires and attachments and so on, how can we give up ourselves? Of course, we won't be willing to give up ourselves if we're not willing to give up our desires. So the, the preliminary the, the, the preliminary practices on the path of bhakti, they're all, um, they, they are all a form of surrender, but partial surrender. We cannot give up our likes and dislikes completely so long as we remain as ego. That is, it's the very nature of ego to have desires and uh, likes, dislikes, desires and attachments. As Bhagavan says in verse 25 of uh, Uludunapadu, he, he, he describes ego as Uruvatrapeyahande. It's a formless demon, ego. This formless demon, because it's formless, it's got no separate existence of its own. So how does it seem to have a separate existence? He, he, that is what he described from the beginning of the verse. Uru patri undam. Grasping form, it comes into existence. That is the very nature of ego. Ego cannot rise without thereby grasping form. Of course, Ego has to come into existence in order to grasp form. So the, the grasping form cannot proceed, it's coming into existence. So it's not, but we cannot come into existence as ego without thereby grasping form. So Urupatri Undam, grasping form, it comes into existence. Urupatri Nikkum, grasping form, it stands. That is, we cannot stand for a moment as ego without constantly grasping form. And the first form we grasp is obviously the form of this body, not just the physical form of the body, all the five sheaths. Because the Bhagavan says in verse 5 of Uludunapadu, uh, Udal Pancha Koza Uru. Uh, the, the, the body is a form composed of five sheaths. Therefore, all five are included in the term body. So whenever Bhagavan talks about body, he's not just talking about the physical form of the body, because we never experience a dead body as I. It's always a living body. So we, the, the physical form of the body is the Anamaya Kosha. The, the life that animates this body is the Pranamaya Kosha. So since we never experience a dead body as I, it's always a living body. So there's always the Anamaya Kosha and Pranamaya Kosha. We also never experience a sleeping body as I. It's always the body, we always experience the body as awake. Even in dream, the body we have seems to be a waking body. So in a body that is not only alive, but also awake, there's a mind, intellect, and will functioning within it. The mind, intellect, and will are what are called Manamaya Kosha, Vijnanamaya Kosha, and Anandamaya Kosha. So these five make up the body. Without grasping this body of this form of five sheaths called body, we cannot rise as ego and we cannot stand as ego. That's why in the first two uh, sentences he says, Uru Patri Undam, Uru Patri Nekom. Grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. But we don't just grasp the form of this body. Having grasped the form of this body, we're constantly grasping other forms. So in the next sentence he says, uh, Uru Patri Undu Mika Ongom. Um, uh, grasping and feeding on forms, it flourishes abundantly. So that means, Having grasped the form of this body as I, we are then constantly attending to things other than ourselves. By attending to anything other than ourselves, we are thereby grasping it. Because ego is a formless phantom. How does it grasp things? It doesn't have hands or arms to grasp anything. It grasps in its awareness. So we grasp things, we grasp forms by attending to them. So whether it's the physical forms of the world 
over forms of thoughts in the mind, we are constantly attending to forms. That means things other than ourselves. And that is the food on which ego lives and flourishes. Mika Ongomi says it grows abundantly. So the food on which ego survives is attention to things other than itself. And then he says, Uruvitu Urupatram. That is because ego cannot stand for a moment without grasping form. If it leaves one form, it grasps another form. That we can we can understand that in two ways. Throughout the waking and dream states, the mind is is jumping from one object to another object to another object. We're constantly grasping one thing after another. So as soon as we our attention moves from one thing, it moves to another thing. That's one way. The other way of understanding it, if we leave one body, we grasp another body. Like uh, when we wake up from a dream, we leave the dream body and we grasp this waking body. Likewise, we're in, at the time of death, if ego isn't, uh, doesn't surrender itself completely, ego is forcibly separated from the body it now takes to be I. So it then it will then it it won't keep so long as there's a dreamer, the dreaming will continue. So each life is a dream. So so long as ego survives, it will continue projecting one body after another and taking that body to be I. So if, if we leave one form, we grasp another form. But then the important thing he says there is Hedinal Otum Pidicum. Hedinal. He doesn't specify when he says Tedin out. Tedin out simply means if seeking. Who is seeking what is not specified there. But what is implied is if we as ego seek to know our own reality by investigating who am I. That's what he implies by Tedin out. Uh, it will take flight. It will run away. So that here Bhagavan reveals that the nature of ego the ego that rises, stands and flourishes by attending to other things will subside and dissolve back into its source by attending to itself. That's what he implies by te dinalo tumpidicum. So in that verse 25, he very clearly reveals what is the nature of ego. So there is only one way in which we can surrender ego, and that is by self-attentiveness. That's why he says in that sentence, in the first sentence of the 13th paragraph of Nana, Anma Chintane Tavira, Vera Chintane Kalamba Vatku, Satram Idum Kodamal, Apmanishta Paranai Iripade, Tanne Isanuku Alipadam. Being Apmanishta Param, without giving the slight, the least room to rising any thought other than Atma Chintana, that is giving oneself to God. So that is that is that should be our aim. But what is a natural um, response that may come to us? If Bhagavan is asking us to attend only to ourselves, to attend to nothing other than ourselves, to not give room to the rising of any other thoughts. But I have so many responsibilities. I've got a wife and children, I've got a job, I've got to earn a living, I've got to support my, my family, I've got to uh, support my elderly parents, I've got this responsibility, that responsibility. How can I just remain just thinking only of myself and not attending to anything else? That, that is a, 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 a question that may naturally arise in the mind of any of us. So Bhagavan gives a very simple answer to that in the next sentence. However much burden we place on God, he will bear all of it. That implies in the context, even the burden of thinking we can leave to God. If, that is, if we, are in, if, if we focus our entire attention on ourself alone, God will then take care of all our responsibilities. That is, as he said in the note he wrote for his mother, um, prarabdha prakaram adhikanavan angangirundu atuvipan. That is, in accordance with the prarabdha of each one, adhikanavan, he who is for that, that means God or Guru, 
Angangirundu, being there, there, being in each place, that implies being in the heart of each one of us, Artu Vipan, he'll make us dance. So whatever actions of mind, speech and body are necessary in order for our prarabdha to unfold, God, will, God is anyway making us do those actions. So we feel, I am, I am working hard, I am earning money, I am supporting my family, I am doing this, I am doing that. Actually, it's all, it's God who's doing all these things. He's using our mind, speech and body to do these things. But because we rise as ego, we, we take on that doership. I am doing all these things. If we attend to ourselves, we as ego will subside. So the doership will go. But the actions that are meant to happen will happen as they're meant to happen. So we need not be, we need not feel that we have any responsibility because what, he, as he says in the next two sentences, endrum nadu vadadu, enwe chikanum nadu vadu. That is, we are free to try to do anything we want to do. That is, we have, as Bhagavan made clear, we have freedom of will. Ichyoswatantra and freedom of action, Kriyaswatantra. Our freedom of will is unlimited. We're, nobody can stop us wanting whatever we want to want. But freedom of action obviously is limited by certain, so, but that we can't do everything we want. I can't suddenly jump out of a window and fly if I want to. It's not going to happen. So there's limitation on our freedom of action. There's no limitation on our freedom of will. But these two work hand in hand. That is, Prarabdha determines what we are to experience. Our will it determines what we want to experience. So what is going to happen according to Prarabdha is going to happen. Not, we cannot change that. If it is not destined to happen, it will not happen, however much we try. I can want anything I want. I can try for anything I want, but it's, it's not going to happen unless it's destined to happen. And then in the next sentence, he says, the, the other side of the same coin, Nadabadu in Tadesi Sayinum Niladu. What is, uh, what is um, to happen will not stop in spite of any amount of obstruction. Iduve Tinnum, this is certain. So we, Bhagavan doesn't deny freedom of will and action. We have that freedom of will and action, but However we use our freedom of will and action, we cannot change what is destined to happen. So his conclusion is, Ahalin monamai irake nandru. Monamai irake, what does he mean by monamai irake? Does that mean we have to sit like a rock and not do anything? No. Actions of body, speech and mind, they, body, speech and mind will be made to act as their des in accordance with their destiny. So, uh, monomai irike means being without rising as ego. If we don't rise as ego, it doesn't matter what the body, speech, or mind do, we will not have the doership for that. So all that all these different strands of Bhagavan's teaching, they all tie together so beautifully. So coming back to the 13th paragraph of Nana, in the second sentence he says, um, uh, However much burden we place on God, he will bear all of it. So even the burden of thinking we can leave to him. He will take care of it much better than we can. So we can leave that to him. Then in the next sentence, he says, this is a really important sentence. When that one Parameshwara Shakti is driving all Karyas, why should we, instead of yielding ourselves to it, be constantly thinking, Ippadi say vendum, Ippadi say vendum. It's necessary to do like this, it's necessary to do like that. That is when he says one Parameshwara Shakti, it, that one Parameshwara Shakti is, is Bhagavan or God or Guru, whatever we want to call it. That is driving all Karyas. All Karyas in this context means everything that ought to happen, everything that's meant to happen, he's making it happen. And that carriers also include everything we are meant to do. So, it, as he says in the first sentence of the note he wrote for his mother, avarava prarabdha prakaram adhikanavan angangirindu artivipan. He will make us do whatever is necessary. 
So why should we be thinking, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that? Leave all, leave all this thinking to him. Our only aim should be to hold on firmly to Anma Chintane and thereby give no room to rising of any other thoughts. Then all the thinking and everything will be taken care of by him. Even if we don't surrender ourselves, he's, he's anyway taking care of these things. By not surrendering ourselves, we are misusing our will and our, we're misusing our freedom of will and action. But we're, we're wanting things and trying for things. Whether they're destined to happen or not destined to happen, we are thereby unnecessarily creating a fresh karma. We're doing a gummya, which is going to get all oh, the fruit of whether the gummya gets added to the sun chitta and will later maybe be experienced as prarabdhi, Bhagavan so chooses. So we are not achieving anything by trying to do things by our own will. We, if we surrender everything to him, everything will happen as it's going to happen anyway, whether we surrender or not. That is, our surrendering doesn't change the course of events. Uh, some people ask, if I surrender to Bhagavan, will he remove all my difficulties? <laughs> no, that is, when, if, you, if you want to have your difficulties removed, you're not surrendering to God. Surrendering to God means let anything happen. It's all his will, whatever his ninishtam enishtam, as Bhagavan sings in the first verse of Arunachya Patikam. Your will is my will. Imbadaku, that is happiness for me. So we shouldn't we shouldn't expect that we that surrender will result in some change in the external events. So all our difficulties will be removed. What the change surrender makes is Whatever happens, we will not be concerned about it. So if we're destined to face difficulties in life, and we all face difficulties in one way or other, if we surrender ourselves, we'll be unaffected by that. And, and surrendering ourselves means we're holding on to self-attentiveness and giving no room to rising of any other thought. Then whatever happens is not going to affect us because we're not attending to it. All these troubles are there because we attend to them. How to be free of troubles? Don't attend to the troubles, attend to yourself. So Bhagavan gives us such a beautiful solution. And then to, to drive home the point, he gives a very beautiful analogy. When the train is carrying all the burdens, why should we, who go traveling in it, suffer carrying our little luggage on our head instead of putting it aside on the train? If we put the luggage aside, then we can travel comfortably. If we carry our luggage on our hip, we're going to suffer unnecessarily. So Bhagavan makes clear here, surrender is a very, a very pleasant path. If we are willing to surrender everything to Bhagavan, let him do whatever he wants. Let him put us in heaven or hell, doesn't matter. We're unconcerned. It's whatever happens, it's his will. So we're happy with it. Then even hell will not be a problem for us. When Upper Swamigal was put in the lime kiln, when he came out, he sang a beautiful verse, saying with, um, I, can't, I, I don't know the verse, but uh, they, he described the, the music of the Vina and the, the cool light of the moon or whatever it was. He gave, he, he was that shows that's the state of true surrender. If we, if we truly surrender, we will not be affected by whatever happens. So is that an adequate answer for what is surrender? Yeah. Yes, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> People think surrender is easy. All this, uh, all this puja and japa, dhyana, meditation, self-inquiry, all these are very difficult. So let me just surrender. Okay, God, I surrender. Now I can do whatever I want because I've surrendered. That's not surrender. Surrender is not rising to have any want at all. So long as we think surrender gives us a license to do what we want, we haven't got a clue what surrender is. Surrender is giving up all those wants, giving up all the likes and dislikes. So, and we, but we cannot give up all our likes and dislikes so long as we rise as ego. So we can, to some extent, lessen our likes and dis, lessen the force of our likes and dislikes and desires and attachments. We can. 
we can weaken them, reduce their strength, but we cannot give them up entirely without surrendering ourselves. Because ego is the root of all these things. Without cutting the root, you can if you if you've got a um if you've got a um a tree, if you keep on cutting the leaves and branches of it, what's going to happen? They're going to keep on sprouting because the root is still intact. Many trees, even if you cut the whole tree down to a stump, it will grow again because the roots are still there. So such is the nature of, um, of ego is the root of all these likes and dislikes. So if you want to surrender our likes and dislikes, if you want to give uh, surrender our will completely to God or Guru, we need to surrender ourselves, the one who has all these, this who has this will. Thank you, Michael. Right. I'll go to the next question. Yes. Next question is from Hema. Uh, we discussed earlier that bhakti means love. In this context, does introversion mean lack of love for others, since introverts often need solitude? Um, it depends what we mean by introvert. That is, introvert is a term used in psychology um, in a very different sense to the sense in which um, uh, antamukam or ahamukam is used by Bhagavan. Antamukam or ahamukam means facing within. Facing within means not facing our thoughts, not being wrapped up in our own thoughts as a, as a psychological introvert is. It means uh, attending only to I. All the thoughts are extraneous to us. So as long as we are thinking of our own thoughts, we are still in Bahia Mukham. Because the, the thoughts of Bahia, they're something other than ourselves. So true, in a spiritual sense, introversion or, is nothing but self-attentiveness. The psychological introvert it's just that's just a personality type. Some people are more outward going, some people are more reserved. But it um it doesn't um and some people don't want to be bothered by the world, so they want to shut themselves off from the world and forget about all the problems of the world. And um that, that's that's something completely different. But <clears throat> with, what Balwa means by ahamukam or antamukam is turning our attention within and fixing it on ourself. So that is the very antithesis of selfishness. Because selfishness is, when we when rise as ego with likes and dislikes, that is selfishness. Uh, turning within is the, is the surrender of that self who had selfishness, the selfish self. So um, the selfish self is ego. So that is what we have to surrender. So when Bhagavan talks about love, he's, he, he's talking about the, the pure love, the love for just being as we are. If we have that love for being as we are, um, we, will, we will thereby subside and then naturally in our outward behavior, we will be kind and considerate and compassionate and everything. Because all selfishness, all egotism, pride, greed, all these, um, these, um, um, these, these different vices, these all arise with ego. So to the extent to which ego subsides, we, the, the distinction between self and others will dissolve. So the more we humbly subside within, the more when we look out, we will empathize with and we'll feel compassion for the suffering of others because we, we will see ourselves in them, at least to some extent. And so we will naturally feel... Uh, so the, a truly spiritual person, a person who is subsiding within more and more and more, the more we subside within, the more kind, compassionate, and considerate we will be. Of course, in this spiritual path, our aim is not to do good in this world. We're not going to rise up and try and solve all the problems of the world because we know that <laughs> problems is the very nature of the world. But 
take rising as ego and taking a body to be I is an invitation for trouble. We all face trouble in some form or other. So many incarnations of God, Rama came, Krishna came, so many uh, such avatars have come, but the world is still, a, is still, is, that is, they, obviously they came for a purpose, but they didn't come to make the world a perfect place because the world is, has never been and will never be a perfect place. Even the highest heaven, even Brahma Loka, is not perfect because so long as you're embodied, there are going to be troubles of one sort or another. The, the, the pleasures there may be more than here. The troubles may be less than here. But it's still imperfect. Anything that is, um, Bhagavan says in, um, in Nana, in the 14th paragraph, um, he says, um, that's the paragraph about the happiness. He ends by saying, um, uh, Jagam embadu nineve, the world, what is called the world is nothing but thought. Uh, Jagam mariam podu, adabdu nitnevatra podu, manam anandate anubadvi kindradu. Um, uh, when the world appears, that is when thought cease, the mind experiences happiness. Jagam tondrum podu, adu dukate anubhavi kindradu. When the world appears, it experiences uh, misery. Because the world appears only when we take ourselves to be a body. So even if the world is Brahma Loka, the highest of all heavens, it's still, it's, it's still a miserable state because we are, so our real nature is infinite happiness. When we rise as ego, we take ourselves to be a body. So we are limiting ourselves to a form. How can this limited form, how can this one who takes itself to be a limited form experience unlimited happiness? It's not possible. So even the happiness of Brahma Loka is defective. Better just to go to sleep, because at least in sleep we're free of all limitations and we're happy. But when we rise as ego, we're unhappy. So um, when he said, um, Jagam Tondrum Podu, when does the world appear? When the ego rises. When ego subsides, the world disappears. So uh, it's what Bhagavan implies here is the very rising of ego is misery. Because when we rise as ego, we are limiting ourselves. And when we limit ourselves, we we separate ourselves, or seemingly separate ourselves. We don't actually, we never actually se separate ourselves, but we seem to have separated ourselves from the infinite happiness that we actually are. So true happiness lies only in a state of not rising as ego. That is the state of true love. Love is always a movement towards oneness. That is in the in the in the, when we look outwards and we we see multiplicity. If, for example, if we love a person, we want to be with that person. We want to be close to that person. Ultimately, we want to be one with that person. So, love is always a a, a movement from difference to non difference. From two-ness to oneness. And as Bhagavan makes many um, many theologians, both uh, in the, um, not only in Vedanta, in the, in the more um, in the less non-dualistic forms of Vedanta, they often say, but uh, true love is when there have to be two, there has to be you and God, and then only you can love God. And it's the same idea is there in most theologies of the world, in Christianity, in Islam, in um, Judaism. They, they think for love, you need two. You need the soul and you need God. And the soul has to have love for God, as God has love for the soul. But Bhagavan makes it clear that is not, so long as you've got two, it's not the most perfect form of love. Because as Bhagavan says in the first paragraph of Nana, 
um, we all have greatest love only for ourselves. That means the greatest love is is both is not love for another, but love for ourselves. He says, um, Yavakum Tanidilaye Parama Priyam Iripadalam. Since everyone has greatest love for us oneself. So if we want to love God with our whole heart and soul, we have to we have to love him as ourselves. So long as we take God to be another, our love for him is defective. Because our love is a movement from one to another. But pure love is, the, is only the self-love. And that self-love self doesn't mean love for the, what we now take ourselves to be, but love for ourselves as we actually are. Because that love alone encompasses, embraces all. Bhagavan, why Bhagavan has such great love for all? Yet Bhagavan's love was, is, is equal to the good people and to the bad people. He has no, he doesn't discriminate because he is not loving us as the person that we take ourselves to be. He loves us as we actually are. He loves us as himself because he doesn't see us as other than himself. He loves us as himself. So if we are to have full love, Purna, um, uh, purna Ambu, we have to, uh, we have to um, love Bhagavan as ourself. And we, of course, we can't love Bhagavan as ourself so long as he seems to be other than ourself. So long as we rise as ego, we seem to be separate from him, so he seems to be another. So it's only by turning, merging back in, uh, into our source, into our own being, and thereby experiencing Bhagavan as ourself, that we can, we can truly love Bhagavan. So until we have surrendered ourselves completely to Bhagavan, and thereby lost ourselves in him, become one with him, our love for him is still defective. Is that an Thank adequate you. answer to that question? Yes, yes, it is. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> right. Next question. Yeah, I think next is my question. So, I wanted to clarify my understanding on Manolaya and self-investigation. Mm. Please let me know if I'm correct or not. Manolaya is temporary cessation of mind. Yes. When practicing self-investigation, Manolaya is not a stage that we have to pass through. However, if we are not doing the investigation correctly, we may end up in Manolaya, but it should not be our aim. The one and only step or stage in the practice is to put our attention on oneself. Whether the mind dissolves or it continues is not a concern for us, but eventually thoughts will stop as we are not attending to it. But that should not be our aim or concern. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, um, partially right. That that is, the cessation of thoughts. Is not is not our aim. Uh, that is cessation of thoughts. It's a byproduct of self investigation. The aim of self investigation is to know and to be what we actually are. If we know and be what we actually are, then the, the thoughts will automatically stop. So yes, so that's why Bhagavan said. In yoga, they say chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga's chitta vritti nirodha. Bhagavan said that's impractical. Why did he say that? Because yes, we can stop the thoughts, but if you if you just try to stop thoughts without trying to know yourself, in other words, without if we try to stop thoughts by any means other than self investigation, it will result in manolaya. That is not our aim. We we go into Manolea every night when we fall asleep. So Manolea is not a big achievement. Even if you call it uh, Nirvikalpa Samadhi, it's still only a state of Manolea. So it's not an achievement. If we, if we are attending to ourselves, we cannot go into Manolea. If we go into Manolea, that means we've let go of the self-attentiveness. That is, when we are trying to hold on to self-attentiveness, we can lose our hold of, on self-attentiveness in one of two ways. Either we can be distracted by other thoughts, 
or we can subside in layer. But if we hold on firmly to self-attentiveness, neither of these will happen. These things, that is, being carried away by thoughts or being um, subsiding in manolea happens only due to pramada. That's only due to the, the slackness in our self-attention. When we lose our hold on self-attention, it can result in one of two things. Either we get carried away by thoughts or we fall asleep. So self-investigation cannot lead to manolea because the manolea can occur only when we let go of the self-attentiveness. Yes, sometimes if we if we are holding on to self-attentiveness for a long time, we may fall, we may subside into a sleep-like state, but that is not because of our self-attentiveness. That is because we've not let go of the self-attentiveness. Is that clear? Yes, Michael. Thank you. Yes, Thank you so yes. much. So, as Bhagavan says in verse 13 of Upadesha um, the, the, the dissolution of mind is of two kinds, layer and nasa. What is subsided in layer will rise again. If its form dies, it will not rise again. So, there our aim is only mano nasa, not mano layer. Uh, yes, Summer, you have a follow up yes. question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. one quick question on this, right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, Michael, you mentioned about holding on to self-attentiveness, right? Yes. What is it like? Like, how does it feel really that holding <laughs> on to self-attentiveness? That we each have to discover for ourselves. We It cannot be, it's not like anything. Because if we say it's like something... Whatever it's like with anything we may use to compare it with, it has to be something other than ourselves. So it's not like anything. So <clears throat> that is why Bhagavan's teachings are all pointers. They're pointing our attention back at ourselves. But what actually is self attentiveness, we each have to find out for ourselves. <clears throat> if you've never eaten chocolate, for example, uh, would you be able to? Would, would uh, or, or supposing you 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 want you want to describe the taste of chocolate to someone who has never eaten chocolate? You cannot describe it. You may say it's like this, it's like that, but still that person cannot know until they actually taste chocolate. That at least ch chocolate we can say it's like this taste or it's like that taste because it's comparable to other tastes. But self attentiveness cannot be compared to anything. So it is beyond words, it's beyond thought. So what is, Bhagavan has given us all the pointers, but we have to, we have to, that's why it, it, is, um, in, it is said in, um, in Vedanta, sravana mana nedititiasana. Sravana means we have to pay close attention to what Bhagavan has taught us. We have to read his writings, um, and and pay close attention to what he says. But, and we also need to make sense of it. We need to think about it carefully. We need to we need to try to understand the connection between what Bhagavan said in one place and what he said in another place. So we have to by by the manana. The sravana is we're learning what Bhagavan has said. Manana is understanding what he has said, making sense of it. But only if we, at least we cannot even begin to practice self-investigation without understanding, at least to some extent. For example, if you tell someone, attend to yourself, if they, if they don't understand that what we actually are is not the body or the mind or any of these things, it's only the, that fundamental awareness I am, they will take, attend to, one, attend to yourself, they'll take it to have some, some other meaning. They'll sit in front of a mirror and look at themselves or something like that. That is so we have to have a certain level of understanding in even in order to even begin to practice this. That is why we start off, we read Bhagavan's teachings, we think about it carefully, try to understand it, try to make sense of it, and then we try to put it into practice. One if we try to put it into practice 
we'll get some better idea what Bhagavan means, but it may not still be clear. So then we go back to his uh, writings and we read carefully what Bhagavan has said. We try to make sense of it. So this, uh, some people describe uh, Sravana Manana as a three-step process. First you have to do the Sravana, then you have to do the Manana, then you have to do Nidhityasana. The Nidhityasana means the actual practice of self-investigation. But it's not like that. It's an iterative process. Because the more we practice self-investigation, the more we will, the more meaning we will see in Bhagavan's words, the deeper our manana will become. So it's an iterative process. As we go deeper and deeper in, in following Bhagavan's path, his teachings become more and more meaningful to us. We we see we see fresh um, implication in what he said. Things that were not so clear to us before become clear to us. So of these three, Sravana, Manana, and Nidityasana, of course, Nidityasana is what is most important because the real clarity comes not just from thinking, but from turning within and putting it into practice because what is the source of clarity? The source of clarity lies in our own heart. That, that fundamental awareness I am, that is the, 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 the light that illumines the mind, enabling the mind to know all other things. So the more we turn within and attend to that fundamental awareness I am, the more clarity we get. The more clarity we get, the more meaning we will understand in Bhagavan's teach. We will, the more meaning we will see in Bhagavan's teachings. If you look at a map of a country you've never been to, you will get some vague idea. Yes, there are mountains here, rivers here, forests here, the sea is here, uh, there's city here, village there. You get some rough idea. But you don't really know what all these means until you go to the country. Once you go to the country, right here, oh, this is the city that is uh, marked there. This is the village. This is the mountain. This is the... Everything becomes more and more meaningful to you, the more familiar you are with the place. So Bhagavan's teachings are like the map. To understand the map, we have to explore the territory that the map is referring to. The territory is our own being. So the more we turn within, the clearer Bhagavan's teachings will become. But Bhagavan's teachings can only show us the way. They can point us in what direction should we go towards ourselves. But we have, to make, we have to make sense of his teachings and put them into practice. The more we put them into practice, the clearer it will become. Is, is that an ad adequate answer to your question? Um, yeah, yeah, Michael, that, that's yeah. good. Uh, just another fall. So you said um, as as we do more and more of self investigation, as we put it into practice, right? Yes. We get more clarity, right? Yes. Yes. So what that what that means is we we uh, the self investigation itself gives us answers. Exactly. Exactly. It may not <laughs> give answers in words, but it would give answers in terms of. The understanding, the understanding will deepen as we go deeper and deeper in the practice. And then the words, Bhagavan's words, will become more and more meaningful to us. Got it. Yep. Thank you. Right. The next question we have is, uh, is it not forcefully stopping all other thoughts when we say turning our mind within? Uh -huh. I can hear. Yes, yes, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is it not forcefully stopping all our thoughts when we say turning our mind within? Question mark. If it is not, how else can we ignore the mental chatter and stay firm is in, in the eye? Question mark. Okay. Um, firstly, when Bhagavan talks about thoughts, he's not just talking about mental chatter. Bhagavan makes it very clear in Nana, as, as I said, in the 14th paragraph, he says, Jagamembadu Nineve, what is called the world is thought. That is the, what, as he says in verse, um, 
verse 6 of Uludunapadu, the world is nothing but the five kinds of sense impression. Sights, sounds, uh, tastes, uh, smells, and tactile sensations. This is all the world is made of. If you remove these, there's no such thing as a world. So these, these sense impressions are mental impressions. So the, the world is nothing but thought. That is thought, but when Bhagavan talks of thought, he uses it in the broad sense of any mental phenomena, any, any, um, any feeling, any uh, perception, any memory, anything. It's all thoughts. Um, so when we are investigating ourselves, we are trying to turn our attention away from all thoughts back towards ourselves. We are not suppressing the thought. As Bhagavan says in, in the sixth paragraph of Nana, Nana, however many thoughts arise, so what? Big deal. It doesn't matter. We shouldn't be concerned about thought. Our, our aim is to know who am I. So in order to know who am I, we have to turn our attention back towards ourselves. To the extent to which we turn our attention towards ourselves, the thoughts will are deprived of our attention, and so they will subside. We are not forcibly trying to suppress the thoughts. All we are trying to do is to attend to ourself. Of course, to attend to ourself, we have to withdraw our attention from other things. If you're um, supposing you're um, you're reading a very interesting book, you may be sitting in a on a on a bus or a train, so many things may be happening around you. You're you're unmindful of them because your your interest is on the book. So if all our interest is on knowing who am I, we'll keep our, our attention will be so absorbed in ourselves, we won't we won't pay any attention to anything else. So the thoughts can't arise without our attending to them. So we are not trying to suppress the thoughts. If, if you try to suppress thoughts, your attention is where? Your attention is on the thought. That's a, that's a self-defeating process because the very attending to thoughts is feeding the thoughts. So the way, to, the way to free ourselves from thought is to attend to ourselves. In yoga, the aim is chitta vritti narodaha, to, to stop the mental activity. The main tool they have in yoga is pranayama. That's why whenever Bhagavan talks about yoga, he talks about pranayama. Because in pranayama, it's a, but by, by, um, by subduing the breathing, you subdue the activity of the mind. So pranayama is a means to uh, bring thought to a cessation. But when thought ceases as a result of pranayama, what happens? It's what the state they call nivikalpa samadhi. But that nivikalpa samadhi, as Bhagavan made clear, is just manoleya. It's of no spiritual benefit at all. So we, we shouldn't be concerned about thoughts. Nindrida sendrida nene vida vindre, Bhagavan says at the end of, um, of uh, six, uh, verse 6 of Arunachashtakam. Let let them let them continue or let them stop. They're not a, they're not other than you. Other than you means who is you? You is Aranachala. And that Aranachala he described in the first line of that verse as Undoru Porul Arivoli Ulumani. You the 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 light of awareness for heart. That is what Bhagavan is referring to. So that light of awareness for heart is our own being. So if we are focusing our attention on ourself, on our own being, let the thoughts appear or disappear. It's no concern of ours because we're not looking at them. So that should be the attitude. Is that clear? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this question is from my friend. Uh, okay. Oh. Let's see. Uh, from a friend uh, who is trying to follow the path of uh, uh, Bhagavan. Yes. He has the question. Yes. The next question we have is, uh, is it true that Bhagavan did not encourage prolonged sitting meditation or self-inquiry? 
If so, is it because Bhagavan wanted us to practice self-investigation throughout the day? Sada Kalamum, as he says in Namya. Yes. yes. Or is there any other reason for it? No. He wanted Sada Kal. Bhagavan emphasized that so much. Sada Kalamum manate apma vaitir kutan apma vichara rupaya. Always keeping the mind fixed on oneself alone is apma vichara. And he says in the 11th paragraph of Nana, um, uh, Oruvan tan sarupa madeyam varayil nirantara sarupa uh, smaranai kai patruvanayin adu andre podam. That is, um, until one attains varupa, if one uh, holds firmly to unbroken nirantara, without the uninterrupted, Swarupa Smarana, self-remembrance, that alone is sufficient. So it's got nothing to do with sitting. We we whether we are sitting or standing or um talking or walking or whatever we may be doing, we are always aware I am. So that uh Swarupa Smarana, as he describes it there, that simply means keeping our mind on our, on that fundamental awareness I am. That's all we need to do. And it, it, it's not necessary to sit with eyes closed. There may be times of the day when we've got no other work to do, then we, we may find it beneficial to close our eyes. But even closing the eyes is not necessary. If you're turning your attention within, it's all a matter of the degree to which we are attending to ourselves. So we try to hold on to at least a a tenuous current of self-attentiveness, as Bhagavan sometimes referred to it, throughout the day, whatever we may be doing, we try not to forget I am. We try to hold on to that self-remembrance throughout the day. When we are, when we have, uh, are, are not engaged in any other activity, then we can try to go deeper within. You, but you don't have to wait till you come home in the evening and sit in meditation pose and go within. Even when you're, um, I mean, most people nowadays, when they go to work, they travel on public transport. We can, we don't have to close our eyes and uh, pretend we're meditating. We can simply be trying to remember our own being. That's all that's necessary. And the more we attend to our own being, the more the mind will subside. So we try to hold on to the self-attentiveness as much as possible throughout the day. And when we are not engaged in our activities, we try to go a bit deeper into that self-attentiveness. Is that a Thank clear, you. clear yeah. answer? Yes, it yeah. is. Thank yeah. you, Mike. Next we, can, we, is... can, we can sit with our eyes closed all day long. But what will our mind be doing? That's what matters. So it's this um, this idea that we need to sit with our eyes closed is um, it, we may find it helpful sometimes to close our eyes and to sit comfortably. But what what matters is not whether we're sitting with us upright back in Padmasana with our eyes closed and all these things. All that matters is the extent to which our attention is on ourselves. Bhagavan wasn't sitting in Padmasana when he had that death experience. He lay down. So if you find it comfortable, lie down and attend to yourself. It really doesn't matter. All that matters is to what extent is our attention on ourself. Sure. Thank you, Michael. Right. Thank you. Next question we have is from Shivaraman. Ramana's approach of going into self is very hard for most commoners. It is not meditation, it is not chanting, it is a state of being. Despite Ramana's being an aspiring role model, it is difficult to imitate his ways. What should be the step-by-step -step approach to follow the Guru? Question mark. This was the question. Hmm? Oh. Okay. This was the question from my friend who is trying okay. to follow. Okay. Um, firstly, we should remember Bhagavan's words. Bhagavan has said, this is the easiest of all paths. To put an end uh, in Anmavide, he says, um, Anmadi 
katavera, to, to untie the bonds of karma, uh, genmadi natum uh, era, to rise out of this, uh, this, um, this uh, devastation of birth. Emmaga uh, adenum, immagum mikelidu. This path is extremely easy. So this is easier than any other path. That is what Bhagavan has taught us. Then why do we why does it seem difficult to us? If you are standing on the edge of a cliff, it's very easy just to step one for, take one step forward and fall off a cliff. But no one can say it's difficult. But if you're if you're asked to take that one step forward, no, no, I can't do it, I can't do it. Why? Because we know if we step over a cliff, we're going to, we're going to, that's the end of us. Likewise, the reason this path seems difficult is because to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, we as ego thereby subside. In other words, this is the path of surrender. Unless we are willing to surrender ourselves, Surrender will seem very, if we're not willing to surrender ourselves, just like we're not willing to step off a cliff, um, it will seem difficult to us. So it is actually, there's nothing easier than attending to ourselves. Why it seems difficult to all of us is because we want to do anything other than attend to ourselves. Because attending to ourselves is stepping off the cliff, it's putting our head on the chopping block. We, that is, we, we are embracing our own annihilation by attending to ourself. Because we are not yet willing to surrender ourself, we are not willing to attend to ourself. So it seems difficult. But if the love is there, there's nothing easier than this. That is why this path is the ultimate path of bhakti. Parabhakti Tatvam, Bhagavan says. Bhava Balatina, Bhava Natita, Sat Bhava Tirutale Undipara, Harabhakti Tatava Mundipara. So being in our in our natural state of just being in Sat Bhava, which transcends all mental activity by the strength of self-attentiveness, that is the supreme devotion. So Bhagavan's path is the ultimate path of bhakti. If we lack the bhakti, then we're going to say, oh, it seems very difficult. It's just, uh, it's not difficult. It's our unwillingness that makes it seem difficult. That is why Bhagavan often said, Bhakti is the mother of jnana. Bhakti, that is, love is the key to success in this path. But love means, that is, self-sacrificing love. If you truly love someone, you don't think about what you can get from that person, what you can give to you, that person. So the, the highest form of love is self-surrender, giving ourselves wholly to God. But that is not possible unless we have love for it. And how to cultivate that love? Only by patient and persistent practice. However many times our mind goes outwards, we try to bring it back to ourselves. By doing this, we are, we are weakening the Vishaya Vasanas and strengthening the Sat Vasana. That is, the Vishaya Vasanas are our inclination to attend to anything other than ourself. Sat Vasana is the inclination to attend to our own being. The nature of Vasanas, they gain their strength from us. That is, the more we allow ourselves to be swayed by any particular vasana, the stronger that vasana becomes. The more we refrain from being swayed by any particular vasana, the weaker that vasana becomes. So when we are attending to ourselves, we are allowing ourselves to be swayed by the sat vasana, and we are avoiding being swayed by any Vishaya Vasanas. So the Vishaya Vasanas gradually lose their weakness and the Sat Vasana becomes strong. That Sat Vasana is what is otherwise called Bhakti or love. It is Swatma Bhakti, love for our own self, our own being. That's why Bhagavan put it so beautifully in um, 
in Nana. In the 10th and 11th paragraph, Tondru Totu Varakindra Vishaya Vasanegal, Alavatra Venai, a Kadalalegal Pole, Tondrinum, Ave Yavum Sarupa Dianum, Kalamba Kalamba, Arindu Vidum. That is, um, uh, though Vishaya uh, uh, Vasanas, which come from time immemorial, um, appear in in uh in unlimited quantities like ocean waves in um avayavam all of them swarupa dhyanam kalamba kalamba when the swarupa dhyana increases and increases rises and rises are individum that is swarupa dhyana means self-attentiveness so the way to weaken these vishaya vasanas and strengthen the vish sat vasana it's only by this constant, constantly trying to, um, to, um, <coughs> to att attend, to be self-attentive. And then he goes on. Atene vasane, vasane galum odungi sarupa matramai irika mudiyama endru ennum sandeha ninevaku sandeha Sandeha nene vakum idum kodamo sarupa dhyanate vidha pidi pidika vendum. That is giving no room even to a doubting thought. Is it possible to um, put an end to all these vasanas and to remain just as sarupa um, without giving room to that thought? Uh, it is necessary to vidha uh, pidi i pidi kavendam. Sarupa dhyanate vidha pidi i pidi kavendam. It's necessary to cling firmly, unleavingly to that sarupa dhyana, the self attentiveness. Oruvan evlo papi ayirandalam. Nan papi ayir kirene. Epidi kadayera po kirin. Endrengi aradu kondirama. Tan papi enum eneteum, arave oritu, sarupa dhyana til ukum ulavanaha irandal, avanichia mai urupaduvan. That is, um, uh, however great a uh, sinner one may be, um, uh, um, instead of lamenting, oh, I'm a sinner, how can I be saved? If, uh, if um, giving up completely the thought that one is a sinner, if one is uh, steadfast in self-attentiveness, he will certainly be saved. Um, that's the 10th paragraph. Then in the 11th paragraph, Manatin Khan Edu Varil Vishaya Vasane Gul uh, Irukindranavo, Adu Varil, Nana Ennum Vicharaneum Vendum. That is, so long as the Vishaya Vasanas um, uh, remain in the mind, um, uh, uh, so long, or the, to, to, that ex to, that, to that extent, the investigation, who am I, is necessary. Ninevugal Tondra Tondra, Apodu Kapode, um uh Avegal Avegale Elam Utpatistana Tileye um uh Vicharneal Nasapika Vendum. Um that is um as, as thoughts appear and appear, then and there, all of them in their very place from which they rise need to be destroyed, we need to destroy all of them in the very place from which they rise by vichara. So by constantly holding on to that self-attentiveness, we are thereby um, we are thereby um, weakening the vishaya vasanas that give rise to all these thoughts. Um, anyate nada dirital veragium aladunirase. That is not attending to any anya, anything other than ourself, um, that is veragya or nirase. That is, that is, veragya means um, freedom from 
passion or desire, de detachment, or nirase. Nirase means uh, desirelessness. Hane vidha dirato nyanam. Being without leaving oneself is jnana. Unmail irendum andre. In truth, the two are the same, are, are one. That is, the, um, not attending to anything else other than ourself, which is veragya, and not attending to us, and not leaving ourself, which is jnana. These two are the same. Um, Muttu kuli uh, po tam ideil kalle kati kondu murki kadaladeil kile kum mutte epiti edu 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 kira uh, golo. That is uh, just as uh, in the same way, but um, uh, pearl divers tying stone uh, stone to their waist. Um, Diving, uh, uh, sinking, and uh, and and uh, how they re in the way that they retrieve the pearls lying at the bottom in the same way. Apadie, ofvaruvanum veragia tudan tanul arndu murki atma mutte adayalam. In the same way, everyone can attain this atma mutu, um, this this uh, this pearl of of self. Um, by sinking deep within oneself. And then in the next sentence, this is one I was referring to earlier. Oruvan tan sarupate adeyam varayal nirantara sarupa smaranaye kai patruvanayin adu andre podum. If one, um, if one uh, clings firmly to um, Swarupa Smarana, self-remembrance, Nirantara Swarupa Smarana, un unbroken, uninterrupted Swarupa Smarana, until one attains Swarupa, Adu Andre Podum, that alone is sufficient. Um, Kote uh, Kul Edirigal Ulla Vare Il Adilirandu Velie Vandu Konde Irpagal. So, so long as there are enemies within the fortress, they will continue uh, coming out from it. Vara vara avegale elam vetti konde irandal kote kai vasapadam. If one continues uh, cutting them down as and when they come, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the fortress will be uh will be captured will come under our control so what is required is constant practice doesn't matter how difficult it may seem to be uh, did we come here to do something easy <laughs> this is this is the supreme endeavor this is the ultimate endeavor for um that any jiva can undertake this endeavor to know oneself so, however difficult it may seem to be, we should persevere in trying. The more we persevere, the weaker the vishaya vasanas will become, and the more love we will have just to be as we are. So we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, give up at the very outset, thinking this is difficult. If you if we give up because it's difficult, then we won't do any we won't do anything useful in life. I mean, any even worldly undertakings are not are not easy, but we still do them because we think they're important. But far more, imp but none of these worldly undertakings actually are important because it's all predetermined. What is what the only thing that is really important is following this path that Bhagavan has shown us. So it doesn't matter how difficult it may seem to be, I, and I emphasize seem to be because it's not actually difficult because Bhagavan has made it clear. It's, it's, what can be easier than attending to ourself? It seems difficult to attend to ourselves because we don't want to attend to ourselves because attending to ourselves means surrendering ourselves, giving ourselves up completely. And that we are not yet willing to do. But to cultivate that willingness, that love, we need to persevere in the practice. Is that a clear answer to that question? Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mike. The next question is from Shivaraman. 
Emotions are bundle of thoughts. It is hard in today's world with so many distractions not to get hurt and react. If oneness in isolation and salvation is the only goal, we can keep quiet. Sumairu. So, how do we detach ourselves from such thoughts and stay away for inner peace? Question mark. It's not just today, but the, the, the very nature of the world is to distract us. But actually what distracts us, if we think about it deeply, we can't blame the world for distracting us. Why do we attend to the world? Because of our vasanas. We, what are vishaya vasanas? Vishaya vasanas are the inclination to attend to vishayas. If we had no inclination to attend to vishayas, no amount of vishayas would, would distract us. Vishayas means objects or phenomena. Anything other than ourself is a vishaya. If we had no inclination to attend to them, they wouldn't uh, distract us. They, the world seems to be full of so many distractions because we, have, we like to be distracted. We like to attend to all these things. And the, that is the problems we face in the modern world may be a little different to the problems we would have faced 100 years ago or 200 years ago. But even 100 years ago or 200 years ago, there were other types of problems. So it's the very nature of embodied existence <laughs> problems. That is, surviving in this body is not easy because, um, of course, we, we survive in this body as long as we're destined to survive. But in the process, we it seems to us, to, it seems to be necessary to work, to earn our living, to... and. Um, in the meanwhile, we've got so many desires we're trying to fulfill, and this is this is samsara. This is the nature of um, embodied existence. But if we, what we need is that love to extract ourselves from this uh, this this samsara, which we've been wallowing in for countless gemmas. So, how to um, how to remain dist uh, undistracted by cultivating more and more love to attend to ourselves. The more we have love to attend to ourselves, the more we will be unconcerned about other things. Because the more we attend to ourselves, the more we subside. The more we subside, the more clarity we get to understand attending to this world is useless. Like that, we all know the world is full of problems. Um, so many wars are there, so much politics, so much uh, diseases, accidents, um, di all types of things. There are problems of innumerable type in this world. But we can't, can we change the world? We see so many injustices in the world. What can we do to stop these? There have always been injustices in the world. So all we can do is we can't set the world right. At least let us try and set ourselves right by trying to turn us within more and more and more. This is the greatest good. There's no good greater than subsiding within. In the final paragraph of Nana, Bhagavan says, Tan erandal sakalumum erum. If oneself rises, everything rises. Tana danginal sakalumam adangam. That if oneself arises, sorry, if oneself subsides, everything subsides. Then this, this next sentence is really important. Evlo kevlo tandu nadikaromo avlo kavlo namayundu. So Bhagavan defines here what he means by good. Evlo kevlo tandu nadi. Tandu implies subsiding, sinking within, being humble, being submissive, be, being sinking down. So we need to live our life, we need to conduct ourselves in this world um, in a tandu, in a subsided manner. The more we are subsided, the more we, the more good it is. So according to Bhagavan, the only real good is subsiding. That is the implication of this sentence. And then he says, um, the last sentence of Nana, manate adiki kon Kondirindal enge irikalam. If one um, 
if one keeps the mind, uh, if one keeps the mind curved, if one keeps the mind subsided, wherever one may be, one may be. So all that matters is turning within and thereby subsiding back into the heart. That uh, for Bhagavan, that alone is the good. And if we are wise, we will try our best to follow this path. However difficult it may seem to be, however unwilling we may find ourselves to be to follow this, we must keep on trying. Then only we will achieve the supreme happiness, the infinite happiness, which is our own real nature. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. We make so many efforts in so many different directions throughout our life. All these efforts are futile. The only effort that is really worthwhile is turning within. Of course, we're all failing in this. I'm failing as much as anyone else, but we need to keep on trying because only by persistently trying will we eventually succeed. And Bhagavan has assured us success is, is, um, is guaranteed, but Guru Katya Varipadi Tavaradu Nadikavendam. Nevertheless, um, it is necessary to follow without fail the path shown by Guru. Bhagavan says at the end of the twelfth paragraph. That is, he he says in the um, he said God and Guru are in truth not different. Just like the prey that's caught in the jaws of the tiger cannot escape, those who have been caught in the glance of Guru's grace will certainly be saved and will never be forsaken. Nevertheless, it is necessary to, um, to, to follow without fail according to the path that Guru has shown. That is, Bhagavan is doing his part. His grace is always there. But we need to cooperate by trying our best to follow this path. Thank you, Michael. All right. Thank you. And the next question we have is from Sanjay. There is an account of Bhagavan refusing to eat food in the dining hall because the ashram manager said that Paradesis will be fed after all others. Bhagavan left the dining hall and sat in Pilakotu refusing to eat. It was meant as a lesson in equality from Bhagavan. In keeping with this lesson, the ashram still feeds Paradesis first. This account is recounted in a Q&A with Sadhu Om in David Godman's blog. Is this true? Was Sadhu Om present when this happened? If so, rough, roughly, when did it happen? Thank you. Um, I don't know exactly when it happened, and I don't know if Sadhu Om was present there. Um, uh, but this did happen. I was, it was sometime, I think, in the 1940s. It was while, it was while the temple, Mother's Temple, was still being constructed. Um, it, that is, during the process of constructing the temple, certain pujas had to be done at certain uh, crucial moments. So it was one day when it was something some important puja was being done in connection with the construction of the temple. And the puja was taking longer than usual. So the paradises, the, the, that means the, the paradises of the sadhus and the, the poor people who come every day to Ramanashram for uh, food, they were getting impatient and asking, why is our food delayed? So, uh, Hearing the, the, the noise they were making, Chinnaswami came out and said, Paradises will be fed afterwards. Bhagavan overheard this. They hadn't yet gone to the dining hall. Bhagavan didn't leave the dining hall. He simply uh, slipped away to Palakotu. And after some time, the puja was over and the dining hall bell rang. And everyone went into a dining hall, but Bhagavan was nowhere to be seen. So no one wants to start eating before Bhagavan. So um, 
um, some people were sent in search of trying to find where Bhagavan was. And eventually someone found that Bhagavan is sitting on, under a tree in Palakotu. So they said to him, uh, Bhagavan, the dining hall bell has rung, everyone's waiting for you. Oh, you, Bhagavan said, you all go and eat in the dining hall. Um, you, you, you go and eat. No, Bhagavan, no one wants to eat without you. No, no, it's not necessary. You eat first, Bhagavan said. Um, this is it was Kunju Swami he often used to tell this story. And Kunju Swami, sometimes he slightly embellishes stories, we, but it doesn't matter. It, it, the way he told it is a nice way. But this person then went back to Chinnaswami, and uh, Chinnaswami uh, thought, oh, maybe Bhagavan's not well. So he sent two devotees who were doctors to Bhagavan, and they went and inquired about Bhagavan's help. I, Bhagavan is your tummy upset, is there any problem? But we said, no, no, no problem, you all go and eat. Um, and so they came back saying they couldn't persuade Bhagavan, but he said there's nothing wrong with him. So th this is where I think maybe Kunju Swami's embellishment, he said that he then sent two, doctor, two devotees who were uh, lawyers, thinking the lawyers will be able to persuade Bhagavan. <laughs> maybe, I don't know, maybe this happened, but it's, it's to me, it's a bit like uh, Kunju Swami's embellishments, but it doesn't matter. It's a nice story. I mean, the sto basic story is correct. So anyway, according to Kunju Swami's version, two lawyers were then sent to try and persuade Bhagavan, but they were unable to persuade Bhagavan. And Bhagavan wasn't saying the reason. Um, Oh, no, finally, I think when the lawyers went and they said, then Bhagavan, why aren't you coming? Everyone is waiting for you. Bhagavan said, no, I'm just obeying Chinnaswami's orders. And they said, what orders? Bhagavan said, Chinnaswami said, Paradesi will, will be fed afterwards. I'm also a Paradesi, so let everyone else eat first, and then I'll eat with the Paradesis. They, they then went back to Chinnaswami and reported this. Then Chinnaswami realized his mistake. So he at once ordered the Paradesis should be fed. And then they came back to Bhagavan and said, Bhagavan, the Paradesis are being fed. Please come to the dining hall. Then Bhagavan agreed. He came. And that is the... Firstly, Bhagavan, it, it's, a, it's a lesson that we should... The Paradesis should be treated as guests and they should be properly respected. That's one, one thing. But the, another important implication of this is Bhagavan didn't consider it as his ashram. Bhagavan had no sense of, of had no mamakara. So it's not, everyone calls it Raman ashram. But Bhagavan never asked anyone to build an ashram for him. He never collected any money. It was the devotees who raised funds and built the ashram for their own convenience. Bhagavan for many years was happily living in a cave on the hill in Virupakshi without any, uh, he was just uh, begging, first he was begging his own food, then when various sadhu devotees came and joined him, they used to go begging. Um, but Bhagavan is just, he came to Tiruvamalai as a beggar. He's a, he's a Pichandi, so he's, he's, that doesn't belong anywhere. So he, that's why Bhagavan taught that, that is that the important implication of this story is Bhagavan didn't consider it as my ashram or he Bhagavan considered himself just as a paradisi. People are feeding him so he's, he accepts the food he's offered. If the, if they stop feeding him, he'll happily go and beg in the town. He's he's got no he's got no attachments of any kind whatsoever. So it's a nice story illustrating the the um the, the total lack of uh ego and um and the total lack of mamakara in Bhagavan. There's no sense of it's my ashram. Thank you. Par pa the word paradesi for those anyone listening who doesn't know, par desa means a place. Paradesa means uh, another place. So outside, Paradesi basically means outsiders. So Bhagavan considered himself to be an outsider. Thank you, Michael. Right. Yeah, I'll ask one more question. So this is from Sanjay again. Can you please tell us in general your experience with Sadhu Om as a guru? What kind of person was he? How did he uh, teach you? Question mark. We know precious little about him. 
since you were associated with him and he was your guru, can you tell us more about that experience? Thank you. The first thing is, Sadhuam was not a guru. He people Some people wanted to take him as guru, but he always said, we are all devotees of Bhagavan. Bhagavan alone is our guru. We don't need any guru other than Bhagavan. So, um, Sadhuam never considered himself to be a guru. I never considered him to be a guru because he wouldn't allow that. That is, Bhagavan is our guru. We don't need any other guru other than Bhagavan. Sadhuam was an exception, a, an exemplary devotee. He, um, people often ask me to tell stories about him. Some people have even asked me to write a biography of him. But what I say is, the outward life is not the real life. Sadhuam's life, the in, inner life is the real life. And if you want to understand the inner life of Sadhuam, then you have to read his, his poetry, his, the, the thousands of songs he sung on Bhagavan. You can, see, you can see in his songs his heart-melting love, how he's constantly praying for, for jnana. So um, only if we... No one can understand Sadhuam without, uh, without going deep into his poetry, because that's where the, the true picture of Sadhuam lies. Uh, um, regarding the outward life of Sadhuam, he lived a very simple life. He was very, he was very simple and unassuming. He never. Um, it's very difficult to. It's. It's very difficult to adequately um, say because whatever I say about him, I feel I'm I'm not doing justice to him because he was his greatness lay lay in his humility and his simplicity and of course in his all-consuming love for Bhagavan and complete surrender to Bhagavan. As far as teaching is concerned. He was always constantly talking about Bhagavan's teachings. Even when, even when having casual com conversations, he would often be reminding us of Bhagavan's teachings. Uh, I remember once someone uh, said to me that they had been to visit Sadhuam, and they, 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 they said, uh, I went there and I found he was joking about Bhagavan's teachings. How can you joke about Bhagavan's teaching? <laughs> Uh, so this person misunderstood because, yes, Sadhuam was joking, but he was using, he, was, he, he wasn't joking about Bhagavan's teachings. He was reminding us about Bhagavan's teachings in a seemingly joking way, but constantly driving home what, the importance of what Bhagavan had taught us. So he wasn't joking about Bhagavan's teachings in the sense of ridiculing, as this person took it to be. He was reminding us of the importance of Bhagavan's teachings. And he was using ordinary, everyday matters as opportunities to illustrate Bhagavan's teachings. Um, <clears throat> I was very fortunate, but I was with him for more than eight years. And... Um, I I'm I, I'm the sort of person I like to to understand everything clearly. So I used to question him relentlessly. And one thing I learned by questioning him, he he um he explained Bhagavan's teachings at many different levels. Um that is many explanations he gave were not the deepest explanations, but they were the explanations suited to the people he was explaining them to. So I found over the years, the more I, the more I was able to understand Bhagavan's teachings and the more I was able to ask deeper questions, the deeper the questions, the deeper the answer. So sometimes he gave me explanations which really satisfied me. And then after some time, some visitors would come or some other people would be there and they would ask some questions and Sadhuam would give some other answer. Not exactly as he said to me. And I think to myself, why does he give this answer? It's not really such a satisfactory answer, seemed to me. So I would ask him afterwards, why when you told me like this, 
did you explain it in that way to these people? Sadhuam says, the questions have to be suited to the questioner. Because the questions they ask are more superficial, the answers are more superficial. If I give a deeper answer, they won't be satisfied. Only that type of answer will suit them. And uh, he often used to remind, this is how Bhagavan taught. Bhagavan, if you read books like Talks and Day by Day and so on, most of the questions are asked just by casual visitors. They are not they are not people who've come only to get moksha. They've come for um they they've come for their own purposes and it, they they have read a little bit of Vedanta and they got some ideas and they asked some questions, but because their questions are relatively superficial, Bhagavan gives answers suited to them at that at their level. In fact, in talks there's one place very that illustrates this very nicely. When uh, Yogananda Paramahamsa, who was um, who uh, he the person who wrote a book called Autobiography of a Yogi, he went to America in the 1920s or 1930s, and he started a self-realization fellowship. In the sometime in the um, mid to late 1930s, he came. Uh, he he visited India. He came back to India for for a tour. And while in India, he visited Raman Ashram. And when he, one question he asked Bhagavan is, what spiritual teachings should be given for the uplift of the masses? Bhagavan replied, teachings cannot be given en masse. Teachings should be according to the taught. So uh, what, what the level of teaching that is given depends upon the... the the pakva of the person who is asking. See, for example, Shiva Prakashan Pillai. When he first, when he came to Bhagavan, what was the first question he asked Bhagavan? Swami, who am I? Because he's so well attuned to Bhagavan's teachings, the result of the questions he asked Bhagavan is this very precious work, Nana, which we have now, which is the very quintessence of Bhagavan's teachings. Likewise, Murugana. For Uladun Apriu, what Murugan asked Bhagavan is, Mayi Nilbum Adu Mayvan Tiranam. That is the me, what is the, the nature of reality and the means of attaining it? So, because he asked such a question, he got such, uh, such clear uh, teachings. But most people don't come with such, uh, with such, um, they're not so well attuned to the Guru, so they ask questions that are, and Bhagavan gives the answers suitable to it. Compare Shiva Prakashan Pillai with Gambiram Seshya. Gambiram Seshya was a, also a good devotee, but he wasn't, he didn't have the pakva, but the, the maturity that Shiva Prakashan Pillai had. So when Gambiram he came to Bhagavan at about the same time as Shiva Prakashan Pillai. But what he what did he ask Bhagavan? He had read various books. Um, this was in the early uh, the early years of the twentieth century, that like nineteen oh one, nineteen oh two, around about that time. He had read various books, including certain books from the Theosophical Society and also the the newly published uh, books of. Uh, Vivekananda on Raja Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma, uh, all, all these, uh, these books of Vivekananda. So various books he had read in English. And he didn't under clearly understand all that he had read. So whenever he came across a passage that wasn't clear to him, he would come to Bhagavan and ask for clarification. Bhagavan would then write a simple summary in Tamil of that of what was written in that English book. Those notes were gathered together, and that later became Vichara Sangraham. This is why, but sometimes when when so when 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 Dambaram Sesha asked Bhagavan to explain certain passages, Bhagavan simply summarized them in Tamil. That doesn't mean that's his teaching. He just made tried to try and make what is said there clear. Because Bhagavan won't try and impose his own uh, teachings on anyone. Sometimes 
uh, Gumbram Sesha asked for further clarification. Then Bhagavan gave his own teachings. This is why the work Vichara Sangraham is um, maybe about 10% of it is pure teachings of Bhagavan. The, the other 90% or so is, is not Bhagavan's teachings. It's Bhagavan's it's summaries Bhagavan wrote of what is written in these English books that Gambram Sesha brought to him for clarification. So this is why if you take the two works, the Chari, uh, Nana and the Chari Sangram, Nana is, every word in Nana is, is very precious. In the Chari Sangram, there are very, very important ideas there, but a lot of the things really do not represent Bhagavan's teachings. So in the same way, just like Bhagavan gave teachings that were appropriate to whoever was asking the questions. When people came and asked Sadhu on questions, he gave answers at many different levels suited to the particular questioner. That is why, because, um, because I, um, well, by Bhagavan's grace, I had that urge to question him more and more. I got, as time went on, I got deeper and deeper answers from him. And um, he also said to me sometimes, he said, uh, when, when I asked him, why do you say like this, give me this explanation, why don't you give this explanation to others? He said, because they don't ask like that. Then he, he sometimes said, he said, um, uh, one problem with, uh, with many of the people who come here, that is in this, in our, uh, this um, Indian culture, people have great respect for sadhus. So they, um, they, um, they will ask questions, but they won't be probing so deep. He, he, Sadhguru said, because you, you are not uh, brought up in this culture, you have that freedom. You, you don't feel any uh, hesitation to probe deeper and deeper and deeper. That is, I, I wouldn't let go of questioning until I, got, until I was satisfied. So one day I'll be satisfied with an answer. Then after some time when I was thinking about it more and more, I, I find it, no, that's not entirely satisfactory. So I would ask more questions. So I was, by Bhagavan's grace, I was happened to be in the fortune position, but I probably questioned Sadhu Om more than anyone else. And so I got a lot of very, very useful things from him. Of course, a lot of these things are in his books, books like, um, like um, uh, Ramana Vari, uh, Sri Ramana. So these things are all uh, are there, but there, even in such books, you can see there are different levels of very different. The way he explains things in some places are not always the deepest way of explaining things. Sometimes he there. Um, uh, because I also question him about these things. Why, why does it say, is it really like this? And when I question deeper, I get deeper answers. Um, so uh, uh, that, that's only a very inadequate answer to that question. But really, I don't think whatever I say ab about Sadhu Om, I don't feel I'm really doing justice to him because he, it's, if you're talking about a person, you're talking about them as if they're a person. But a jnani is not a person. He outwardly appears to be a person, but actually something far, far deeper than any person. So that's why I say to get a deeper understanding of who Sadhu Om is, what, what, what Sadhu Om was like, it's necessary to read his songs. So only those who are fortunate to know Tamil and can go deep into his songs can really um, appreciate the, how deep he was, how deep his devotion was, how deep his jnana was. Thank you, Michael. Right. Uh, next question we have is from Sanjay. This is the last question that we have. Uh, 
Okay. Can you please summarize the message of uh, Anma Vidai? Thank you. Ayayati Sulapum. Anma Vidai, Ayayati Sulapum. <laughs> that is, that is, it's the, the Pallavi itself is a summary of the whole thing. That is, Murugana wrote that Pallavi and the Anna Pallavi in order to prompt Bhagavan to clarify that. So the whole song is clarifying that. But uh, uh, Atma Vidya is so, so easy. But as Bhagavan says in the last, uh, um, last paragraph, in the last verse, Arulam Vainame, Ambu Poonamme, Imbu Tornamme. That is, grace is necessary. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, ambu, ambu means love. Purnamé means adorn yourself with love. That is only if we have true love, we can fully gain the benefit of this. And where does that love come from? That love comes only from grace. So grace, as Bhagavan often said, grace is the beginning, the middle and the end. It's grace that draws us to this path. It's grace that guides us along this path and motivates us to follow this path and finally it is grace that will swallow us so whatever whatever love we have to follow this path is bhagavan's grace working through us whatever effort we make as a result of that love is is bhagavan's grace working through us people often think uh, uh talk about grace and effort as, as if they're two different things. But if we are making the right effort, that is only by grace. And grace is not, grace, as Bhagavan said, grace is not something up in heaven that's going to descend on you one day. Grace is there in your own heart. What is shining in your heart as I, that is grace. So we have to, the grace is always available. But we have to yield ourselves to it. We have to cooperate with it by turning within. And the liking to turn within, the love to turn within, that is the, the, the result of grace. So ultimately, it's all a matter of grace. But we shouldn't just think, oh, let grace do everything. I, 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 there's nothing I can do. No, but grace has to work through us. So it works through us in the form of the love that we have to turn within and the effort we make, the persistent attempts to turn within more and more and more. That's all the fruit of grace. That's all the act of Bhagavan's grace. Thank you. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think Bhagavan wrote Dharma with the... Uh, to clarify that this is not difficult, if I'm not wrong. Like, that's exactly, not exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That is, there's, there's, there's a story behind that. But uh, um, Murugana told Sadhu on. He said when he first came to Bhagavan, after he'd been there a day or two, someone approached him and, and said, uh, Bhagavan is very, very great. He's a periyavastu, a very, very great thing. But nobody can understand Bhagavan. Nobody can uh, get anything from Bhagavan um, directly. So here there's a great one called uh, uh, called Nayana, Kavyaganta. Uh, and uh, if you take mantra diksha from him and, and do uh, mantra upasana, then only you, you will um, be able to understand Bhagavan. And Murugana was surprised uh, at this, so he just kept quiet. Then that person said to him, I think about it, I'll come back later and ask for your decision. So after some time, that person came back to Murugana, and Murugana told him, I came here only for Bhagavan and Bhagavan's grace. Uh, if Bhagavan wants to give me his grace, well and good. If he doesn't want to give me his grace, I don't want anything from anyone else. And um, then... Uh, Murugana, when he told this to he said, they then gave me up as a hopeless case because they never tried again to, to do that. But um, because they were always saying this, Bhagavan, what Bhagavan teaches is very, very difficult. And Murugana, of course, knew that that's not the case. 
So he wanted Bhagavan himself to say how easy it is. That's why he wrote the Pallavi and the Anupallavi and asked Bhagavan to write the, the Charananga, the verses. And Bhagavan, of course, understood the reason Murugan asked, and so he complied with it. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So it's a very, very beautiful uh, song, that Anma Vidya, very important. And Bhagavan has summarized his teachings in it uh, in a very compact form. All his, uh, um, all his basic teachings are, are given there in Anma Vidya. Thank you, Michael. Okay. I think that was the last question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again so much for Thank all you. your time. And uh, it's so amazing question. that you can remember all these things and we can explain it. Uh, so oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bhagavan's teaching, that is Bhagavan, Bhagavan wrote about, he, his original verses comes to about 250 verses, the verses of, um, of uh, Stuti Panchikam, Upadeshundia na Uludu Napdu Uludu Napdan Bandam Anma Vide Aplapatu Ekam Panchkam. I think this comes to 200 to 250 verses in all, if you count them all up. And he's written Nana. If we, if we, these are the, the, the main original writings of Bhagavan. If we familiarize ourselves with these and absorb these, that's all we need to understand because. When we when we read Bhagavan's writings, whether his uh, poetry or uh, his prose, initially there's the meaning of what he says. We need to understand the meaning, but that meaning there's also a huge amount of implication in that meaning. So the more we the more we go deep into Bhagavan's teachings, the more we will realize what a huge treasure is there in Bhagavan's original writings. That's why I'm able to answer all these questions. Because if you notice, I'm mostly I'm answering from Bhagavan's own works, because the answers to most questions are there either explicitly in Bhagavan's own writings or implicitly. What he hasn't said explicitly, he is clearly implied. But we need to we need to go deep into his teachings to understand that. Going deep into his teachings means not only studying. Uh, um, I mean, uh, reading them repeatedly. That's for sravana. We need to think about them, and most important of all, we need to put them into practice. Then only we get the clarity to to see the huge wealth of. Um, of bhakti and jnana, but is there in Bhagavan's uh, work, uh, own writings. And those bhakti and jnana are not two different things. Ultimately, they're one and the same. Thank you, Michael. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Namo Ramana. Namo Ramana. Thank you.